ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يغفر له من يغفر له فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد يحيي ويميت وهو على كل شيء قدير ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم الذي يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منكم رجال رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليهم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشر الأمور محتفاتها وكل محتفة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. All thanks and praises due to Allah. We seek His help and His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from evil within ourselves and the consequences of our evil deeds. Whomever Allah guides well, will never be led astray. And whomever Allah lets go astray will never find guidance. And I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. Alone without any partners, and every witness that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is his messenger. Tabarak al-ladhi biyadhi al-mulku wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir, ladhi khalaq al-mawta wa al-hayata liyabluwakum ayyikum ahsinu amala, wa huwa aziz al-ghafoor. Today I came to you to talk about success, and how we define success in Islam. In these first two verses of Surah al-Mulk, Allah does just that. He says, Blessed is he in whose hand is the dominion, and he is over all things competent. And he is the one who created life and death to test you as to which of you is the best in deeds. And he is exalted, the mighty, the forgiven. There's a lot of things to be said about these, just these two verses uh, in Surah Al-Mulk. It starts off with Al-Mulk. What is Al-Mulk? It is the dominion. It is everything that is ruled over. It is all creation. And Allah is saying is all that. You know, blessed is he who has complete control over all of creation. He's the one who's all wise and all forgiving. So, what is the all wise, the creator of the whole universe, the one that has complete control of everything? What does he say? He's the one who's over everything capable. Why did he create everything? This is a question that makes people spend their entire careers trying to answer. Thousands of years, philosophers have spent so much time trying to answer this question what's the purpose of life? Why do we exist? Why does everything exist? And here, in eight words, it's just eight words, Allah tells us exactly the meaning, the purpose. Why he, the wise, the creator, the powerful creators, the Ahsan to test which of you is the best in deeds. And that's it, that is the answer that so many people seem to look for. And the thing is that's very interesting about this point, and that I think Kathir and many other people who uh, have explanations of the Quran, uh, they transmit and say that it's very interesting, very important here that Allah mentions it's a very interesting point that Allah says who's the best in deeds and not who is the most of deeds. And that's an interesting point that um, one of my teachers, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, is uh, Mufti Hussain Kamani. He comments on this point. He says that deeds, a very beautiful uh, reflection, that deeds are, on the day of judgment, they're scaled, they're weighed. And when you weigh something, that implies that they have a mass to it, they have three dimensions, if you will. Uh, for example, if you have an idea, you don't weigh an idea. You, you'd say, I have like, a great idea, or I've had five ideas this month. You count them. If you have money, you count your dollars. You don't weigh your dollars. If you have land, you size your land by acres or some other measurement. You don't weigh it. But deeds here is saying weights, like you would gold or silver or some other thing that has a mass to it, which implies there's different dimensions to it. And one way to look at it is three dimensions of a deed would be intention, uh, and your sincerity. Another dimension to it would be the efforts you're putting forward, how much effort. And the third would be the excellence and how complete that deed is. And so those are three aspects of deeds that will give it weight. And so you can have a deed that might be uh, massive in size. It's like such a huge donation, but the sincerity is very small. And so it's going to be a light deed on the day of judgment that might get blown away in the wind. Whereas you might have something that's very small, just a few dollars, like one dollar donated out of true sincerity. And that deed on the day of judgment will have so much weight on those scales. And so that's a beautiful way to look at our deeds because it's not just about who has the most, who does the most, it's who does the best in excellence. And how does he end this? So if our point is to be tested uh, with these deeds and who does the best of deeds, how does Allah uh, end this verse? He tells us, he reminds us that he is mighty, but he is forgiving. And that's so important because if we get caught up in this idea of a test and we feel so under so much pressure, we all make mistakes. And a lot of times people fall under the guise of guilt and you get tripped up 
they think they're running this race, and once you trip in a race, you can't get back up, you're going to be last place, and it's a depressing day. But that's not how Islam is. Islam is forgiving, and Allah reminds us here, despite our test, He's there for us, and He is forgiving. And so if we slip up, Islam is about getting right back up, and then trying again, and it's expecting those failures. And the other thing is that it's not, so it's not about letting those failures get you down, and at the same time, it's not about, how do you put it, it's not about just uh, the accumulation of random deeds, it's about putting in your effort. And the last thing is that you cannot control the outcome of your effort. And so, uh, so you can't define success by the outcome. You know, there'll be so many prophets that come on uh, the Day of Judgment that'll have a few followers, a handful of followers. Some will have two followers, some will have one follower. There'll be prophets that spent their entire career doing da'wah, and they'll have no one that followed them. But those people will not be failures. In the eyes of Allah, they were successful, not because of the outcome. Because that is completely with Allah. He cannot hold us accountable for the outcome. It is completely in His hands. Instead, He holds us accountable for the intention and our efforts. And that is such a beautiful concept to remember. Um, and I think one of the most beautiful reflections of this, one of the most beautiful stories that really embody a lot of these concepts is the story of a Sahabi that unfortunately not many people have heard about. His name is uh, Abu Dahdah. And his story starts with a orphan. During the time of the Prophet there was an orphan boy whose parents left him behind a small plot of land and a few animals to take care of for his livelihood. And so he decided to build a fence around this land so he can take care of his animals, they don't run away, they don't get stolen, so he can afford them. And so he started building this fence. And while he was doing that, there was this big tree, a big tree, that was coming from his neighbor's yard and blocking the path. And he couldn't go around the tree because that would be stealing from his neighbor. And if he cut on the inside, the land was too small. And so he needed to go through the tree. So he went to his neighbor, Abu Baba. And he said, oh, Abu Baba, will you give me this tree um, as a gift or as a charity so that I may build my fence? And Abu Baba said, no, this is my right. It's my hawk. I'm not going to give up this tree. And so the boy said, that's fair. Can I buy it from you? And Abu Baba still refused. He said, I will not sell this tree. This is my hawk. And it's fair. It's his source of income. And so the boy got frustrated and he said, he ran to the Prophet Sallallahu which is such a beautiful concept. Just imagine that, you know, playing to have a boy who has an issue, an orphan boy, and he has that openness to the Prophet Sallallahu where he runs to the Prophet for the first thing, first thing he thinks of, and he goes and tells the Prophet Sallallahu the story. So the Prophet Sallallahu smiles, he asks someone to go get the man, Abu Baba, and he confirms with him the story. He said, is this what happened? Is this true? And he says, yeah, that's true. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi asks him the same thing. He asks, can you give this tree as a gift uh, to the boy? And Abu Baba refused, he said, this is my hawk. And so the uh, Prophet Sallallahu asked again, he said, will you, we will buy this tree from you, will you then give it to this boy? And the man again refused. And then the uh, Prophet uh, of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he tried a third time, he said, O oh, Abu Baba, Allah promises you that if you give this tree to this boy, he will give you a tree in Jannah, the likes of which nothing has been seen. It would take a rider 70 years to cross from one side to another on horseback. And the, the word that was used for the tree itself is, is describes a tree that's so heavy with fruits that the branches start sinking. And so he describes such a magnificent tree of Jannah that would be gifted to him, promised to him if he gave his tree up. But Abu Laba refused and the boy started to tear up and cry. So around there were some Sahabi that heard this and amongst them was this Sahabi that we want to talk about, Abu Dahdah. Now a little backstory on him. He had a plantation that was amongst the most uh, luxurious plantations in Medina. He had the most uh, trees, uh, palm trees for dates. And Medina is a city that was agricultural and grew dates and exported dates. That's their main source of income. And so he had the biggest farm, the most trees, the highest quality, you know, uh, non-GMO, organic date farms. That was Abu Dahdah's farm. And so everyone knew who he was in the city of Medina. He hears this and he goes to the Prophet and he says, if I gave that tree to that boy, would I get the same reward? And the Prophet Sallallahu said, yes. So he went to Abu Lubaba, Abu Dahdah went to Abu Lubaba, the man of the tree, and he asked him, he said, do you know my orchard? And uh, Abu Lubaba said, of course, who does not know of your orchard? He says, I will give you my entire orchard and everything in it, it includes his house, all the trees in it, the land. He says, I will give you my entire orchard for that one tree. Abu Dahdah, uh, Abu Lubaba was like, no way, you're crazy. He said, he literally told him, he, you have gone insane. And he says, no. He called the Prophet he called all the Sahaba, and he says, I want you to bear witness that I'm giving my land to Abu Baba for this one tree. And the transaction is made and it shook on him. So imagine Abu Baba, he thinks, wow, overnight millionaire, just for that one tree. And so Abu Dhabi comes to the Prophet and he says, 
Oh, Rasulullah, do I get that tree of Jannah? Do I get that tree? He's doing all this for one tree in Jannah. And the Prophet of Allah said, no. Allah promised one tree for the one tree of Abu Dhabi. And you did not get one tree. You gave your entire orchard and Allah is way more generous than you are. So he says, you're going to get an orchard in Jannah of those trees and then the like of it. And then the like of it. And then the like of it. And he kept repeating that. And then the like of it. And the like of it. He kept repeating it so much. And so not a single Sahabi around had not wished that in that moment they were Abu Dhabi. <coughs> so he was elated. He ran home to his wife and his kids. And he told them, get out. Get out. And they said, what's wrong? What happened? He said, we sold the house. We sold everything. And then she's like, for what? What did you sell the house for? And he told her, we sold it for land in Jannah. <coughs> she says, Rabbi Hamdiyah, what a successful transaction. What a successful transaction. That's an immediate reaction. They gave up everything they had for that land in Jannah. What a successful transaction. And there's even another narration that mentions that one of their boys had a date in his hand from their orchard. He was about to eat it. And he took it from him. He said, this doesn't belong to us anymore. That level, to even a single date. There's so many lessons I think that we extract from this beautiful story. Is one of the the first thing that comes to mind is that you know he did not have to give his entire orchard. He could have given a third, half, fifty trees, whatever it was. He could have given still an unequal amount of you know property for that one tree and still made a transaction. And he decided to make it from the first offer. He didn't have it from the first offer. He gave everything he had. He had that level of sincerity and desire. For Jannah. He wasn't trading for a tree. In his mind, he was trading for Jannah. For a single tree in Jannah. And so that's a beautiful reminder of the kind of ihsan, the kind of desire he had, and the reality he had of Jannah. He saw Jannah as reality, more real than even the things in front of him. His own land, his own income. Such a beautiful example. And he did not give from what was easy to give. He gave from what was hard. It was what he was famous for. It's what he provided his family with. It was uh, the thing that he held most dear. And he gave from what was most dear, from the best things. A lot of times we donate, for example, the worst clothes. And you know what? It's great. It's, every donation is good. But a lot of times we often we give the used clothes we have. We, we give things that have holes in it or things that we're done with. Things that are easy to give. Instead of giving the best, the, our favorite jacket or buying something new for someone, going out of our way. So this is an example in terms of that. And seeking the reward from Allah and nothing else. And going back to the weights of the deeds, like imagine a deed weightier than this. He gave everything to get that dimension of sincerity and completeness and ihsan. And so this is a beautiful example, I think. Uh, you know, uh, may Allah forgive us and seek forgiveness of Allah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. As-salamu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. And so again, just to go over a few brief points before we begin our prayer. In Islam, there's a very beautiful concept and that should give us all hope. And that is that it is not about the outcome of our deeds, but that is about the intention and the effort of our deeds. Uh, your intentions are judged by your, uh, your genes are judged by your intentions. In my amal of the as the Prophet taught us. And the rest is with Allah. And there's so many examples of you just having to put in that foot forward, putting in that effort, and then the results are with Allah. For example, Musa, he struck the staff. He struck the staff on the water to split the seas. Allah split the seas. Nobody has ever struck a staff that has had the sea split before Musa and or after Musa. And Musa did not have to split like this. He didn't have to put any effort forward for that to happen. It was completely Allah. But Allah still made him put in a little bit of effort to make the outcome happen. And that's an example for all of us to put in that foot forward. And no better time is to do this and practice this than Ramadan. And next week, inshallah, we'll be beginning the beautiful, blessed month of Ramadan. And so, inshallah, if we just practice, we find each one of us knows our weaknesses and our strengths. We find a bad habit and we try to block it out and have it lead by the end of Ramadan. And we find one good habit to try to instill. It's the month of Ramadan, and one example is trying to build a better relationship with the Qur'an. If we are people who don't constantly read, try to read a little bit of Qur'an each night. Make it constant, even if it's not a lot. And if that's easy for us, it's something we already do, then try to finish a khatam if that's something we've never done of the Qur'an. And if that's easy for us, try to memorize a little bit of the Qur'an. And if you're a hafid, try to seek a higher understanding of what you're reading. Try to internalize it. Try to practice some of its meaning. There's something there for everybody at every level. Inshallah, may Allah forgive us, may Allah accept us. May Allah allow us to reach Ramadan. It is not guaranteed for us. Uh, and there will be people who were with us in Ramadan last year who are not with us today. May Allah have mercy upon them and may Allah accept from their past deeds and may they be a reminder for us for our death uh, that we will for sure uh, seek and we will for sure face someday. Uh, may Allah forgive us from all of our sins.